Call and response has long been a way that the church has functioned during worship, right? If I say to you, the Lord be with you, what are you going to say back? Unless, of course, you're in the church that I heard about when I was in seminary. If I had been there, I would never have been in the ministry because I would have laughed myself right out the door. The bishop was speaking to a congregation, went to the microphone, filled it with it a moment, said there's something wrong with the microphone, and the entire congregation responded, what? And also with you. They didn't listen to what he said. They just knew that they were supposed to respond. The hymn that we had, you know, come Christians join to sing, alleluia, amen. Back in the day when people didn't have all the words to hymnals in their hymnals or all the music, it would be, come Christians join to sing, and the congregation would sing, sing what back? Hopefully you did a little better than that, but we'll take that. If you're at Memorial Stadium, where am I? I'm in the Wayback Machine. If you're at Camden Yards, wake up, Terry, it's the 21st century. If you're at Camden Yards and you hear, da 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 what do you say? You don't say it like that. da 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 Now, that sounds like an Oriole fan there. Now, my husband was a Southern Baptist boy. He came to hear me preach. That was our first date. He came, he drove 300 miles to hear me preach. And I'm preaching along, and he says, Amen, because he was a Baptist. And the Methodists responded with what? <gasps> <laughs> now, he said to me, are you sure they're not Quakers? I said, no, they're just very quiet in their faith. He said, apparently so. Now, I, the last time I preached at an ecumenical service, it was in Martinsburg, West Virginia, on a Good Friday. I was preaching one of the seven last words of Christ. I was preaching, and there were people who were responding to my preaching, saying things like, testify, tell the story, Rev, go on, go on, come on now, come on now. Now, later, people came up to me and apologized and said, we're sorry that people made all that noise during your sermon. I said, are you kidding me? Pastors live for that. We like to hear an amen now and then, as opposed to the sound of snoring and hardening of arteries and creaking bones or things like that, or crickets when you're preaching. You know what crickets are, right? When everything's quiet and you hear the crickets, cricket, 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 cricket. We like having a response when we preach. Now, there's a response that sometimes pastors will say if they're not, if the congregation is particularly quiet, or if they want to get a response, and it is, can I get a witness? Anybody ever been in a service and hear, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Now, I guess not, because you're all very quiet this morning. Can I get a witness? There's one. But you know what more than can I get a witness to get an amen means? It's you're asking someone to get up and tell the story of their own faith. Now, I went with my husband to his Southern Baptist congregation a few times. It was great. The first time he introduced me, he said, the pastor said, this is, this is Brother Richard's intended, Sister Terry. And they all went, oh, that's so wonderful, that's so wonderful, that's so wonderful. How wonderful, how wonderful, how wonderful. So she's a good Christian woman. They went, Oh, yes, 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 yes. And then he said, she's an ordained United Methodist clergy woman. That time, the Baptists were the ones who went, oh. <laughs> but his pastor was known to say, all right, Sister, Sister Laura, you're going to do the prayer this morning. And Sister Laura would get up and pray. We were there visiting. My husband was sitting next to me, and he said, the pastor said, Brother Richard, come up here and do the prayer. Brother Richard said he had to remind himself, I'm not a Methodist anymore. I'm a Baptist. i got to preach a long prayer, preach a long prayer. Can I get a witness? Means, do you know what I mean? Have you experienced it? That's what a, when a preacher's asking for the feedback, that's what they're asking for, for you to say, yes, I know what you mean, and I know what you're talking about, and I, I absolutely agree with you. It's like amen. We sing amen at the end of sermons, at the end of sermons sometimes, or at the end of a prayer. We used to sing it at the end of hymns, but you don't have to sing it at the end of hymns. And people got so mad when we took it out of the hymnal. Do you remember when we took it out of the hymnal, the amen? Everyone want to say, hey, man, at the end of whatever we were singing. But if you've sung it, you don't have to say amen. You amen something you haven't said. You amen somebody else's words. If you're singing them yourself, you're doing that. And i got to say, Lambert, Charles Wesley would not have recognized his hymn this morning. That was a Charles Wesley hymn that Lambert just sang for us. Charles was liking it, I'm sure. He's like, wow, listen to what they're doing. They're still singing my music, and they're singing it in a different way, in a different culture, and that is a great thing. But um, can I get a witness was when the preacher would say, can I get a witness, meaning I want somebody to stand up and come up and testify to what God or Jesus Christ has done in their life. Because a witness is someone who has personally experienced the blessings of the Lord. That is what that means. Now, I started this sermon a few weeks ago. I've been trying to work way ahead because of 
working with new musicians and trying to get ahead for vacation Bible school. And I was reading part of Marvin McMickle, who is a retired seminary president. He was at Colgate Rochester Divinity School in New York. And his definition of a witness, coming from the passage that we just read in Acts, that ascension passage, he says a witness is someone who sees something, says something, and suffers something. Sees something, says something, suffers something. He wrote a book on prophetic preaching. That's where he wrote about this because he said this is the call to prophetic preaching. Now, prophetic preaching is, is when you're saying something that nobody wants to hear, basically. That's how you can, you can define prophetic preaching because one person's prophet is another person's political pundit. And I've heard so many times, we don't want politics in the church, do we? No. So I'm not supposed to say anything about what goes on in the world, right? Eh, hard to do, isn't it? This was a tough week for me, I tell you that right now. And I spent um, Thursday afternoon at Pedonia International School with teachers and students and parents, little kids afraid to walk into their school anymore, parents terrified about sending their kids to school, and teachers standing there literally sobbing because they watched the looks on these children's faces because another school shooting has happened and we have done nothing as a nation, nothing at all, other than say, oh, well, what are you going to do? Um, so I apologize that this sounds political to you, but I did watch the NRA, some of the, their proceedings the other day, and someone at the NRA convention proclaimed that the man who did the shooting is burning in hell right now. He's in my territory, so I figure I can go back into his a little bit because no one has the right to proclaim anyone else in hell. You agree with me on that one? Can I get a witness to that? Can I get an amen on that? No one has the right to say anyone else is burning in hell because only Christ is the judge of humankind. Amen. Only Christ is the judge of humankind. What did Jesus say in the passages that we read this morning? You will be my what, did he say? You'll be my what? My witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. And where are we going to be my witnesses? In Jerusalem, starting in Jerusalem. What's the problem? This is 40 days after he was raised from the dead. 40 days after Easter comes the ascension, then 50 days is Pentecost. Must have been a long 10 days while they waited for that Holy Spirit to come. This is not John's gospel where he had already breathed the Holy Spirit into them. This is Luke saying, 10 more days and the Spirit's going to come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem. What had just happened in Jerusalem three days before the Easter resurrection story? They nailed him to a cross. Those who followed him in order to be his witnesses in Jerusalem had to confront the same people who had killed their Lord. Then in Judea, Judea, their home country. But were they always welcomed throughout Judea? No, but there were going to be his witnesses there. And Samaria. What's the problem with Samaria? It's full of Samaritans. We don't like Samaritans. You know, we tell that story about the good Samaritan. That is not mentioned in scripture at all. But we're so used to Samaritans being the bad guys, we have to call this one the good one. There was one good Samaritan and a whole bunch of them. That's how we treat them our own Samaritans. In those days, Jews wouldn't even say the word. The man at the end of that story with Jesus, the, the lawyer who had gone to question him to try to trip him up, he said to him, which one showed, which one was the neighbor to the man? Because he had asked the question, who's my neighbor? Jesus said, which was the neighbor? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. He couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. That's where Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. In Samaria? Are you kidding me, Lord? That's where you want me to go? To Samaria? Are you out of your mind, Jesus? Is what they're thinking to themselves. And then to the ends of the earth. I don't know about you, but Cockeysville, Maryland is about the ends of the earth from Judea and Palestine as you can get in the first century. And did he say, you might be my witnesses? You could be my witnesses. If you were willing, you could possibly say something about me. He said, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Now, when I do weddings... There are so many brides who want to say, I do, instead of I will. Our service says, I will, instead of I do. And they're all like, when do I say, I do? And I said, you don't. You say, I will. But I want to say, I do. And I say, why? Because that's what they say in movies. And we all know how well those turn out, right? Some of you who spent too many hours watching the trial this week between Johnny Depp and whatever his wife's name is, I don't even remember because I didn't watch it, but... If you say, I do, it's talking about right now. I do today. When you're all dressed up and you're looking at the guy and he's in a tuxedo, he's never going to look that good again. You know that, right, ladies? 
Did your husband ever look as good as the day you married him? Larry's looking at me like, aw, aw. But how about your wives with that dress and the hair and the makeup and everything else? You're never going to look that good or smell that good ever again. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, I do. But talk about a couple of months, a couple of years down the road. It's like, I will, I will. I've said my husband's call and response with me was often if I did something really ridiculous, which I tended to do often in my marriage, I'd say, do you love me? And he'd say, I must. <laughs> I must. To put up with this nonsense, I must. But Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. They want to know, when are you going to restore the kingdom, Lord? When are we going to be back on top? When are we going to be in charge again, Lord? And he says, that's not what this is about, because his kingdom is not an earthly kingdom, is it? Or was it? It is, because we know that they witnessed. Why do we know they witnessed? Let me ask you that. You can figure this one out if you think about it. Why do we know that they witnessed to him, to what he had done and what he had taught and how he had lived and how he had died and how he was raised and how he was descended? How do we know they witnessed to them? Because we're here, absolutely, because we're here. We are here because they took seriously his word. Because when that spirit came upon them 10 days later, they let it fill them up and they let it send them to where they needed to be. You will be my witnesses, that's what he said. You will be my witnesses. And here we are witnessing to Christ. So what does it mean to say that in order to be a witness, you have to see something and you have to say something and then maybe you have to suffer something? I told you, you know, sometimes the world gets political. John Wesley was famous for saying, damn your charity, we want justice. That's kind of a political statement. And Jesus himself stood up against Rome. I'm not going to tell anybody that you shouldn't have guns, although I believe you shouldn't have guns. And I'm allowed to say that. Why? Because I work for Jesus. He's on my side with that one. We don't need all these guns. Our nation is absolutely addicted to guns. But this is not about the Second Amendment. But this is about not doing anything when children are being murdered in their schools. We do nothing. We do nothing. The terror on those children's faces on Thursday was something I don't like seeing. And the teachers, and now we want to arm teachers and lock all the doors except one. I was a baby boomer. I went to Delaney High School when half the 10th grade had to be at Cockeysville Junior High because there were so many of us. Can you imagine 1,800 people going in and out one door? It would take till lunch to get us all in until dinner to get us all out again. We'll come up with everything other than any sort of sane and sensible looking at our dependence on weaponry because we're addicted to weapons. I think we're called to witness something greater and something different in the world. I've told the story about my custodian in my last congregation who was a young man who was addicted to heroin at one point in his life and sold heroin at another point in his life. He came to my church the first time when his friend had committed suicide. He'd hanged himself in the basement because he'd gotten out of prison he had been clean and sober for the time he was in prison for three years. He got out and immediately became hooked on drugs again. Child of the congregation, someone who had grown up there. I remember his grandmother, who looked so much like any one of you sitting here today. I remember the agony in her face that her grandson was gone because of drugs. And I said to the ladies in the congregation, I've told you this before, if you've heard it, I'm sorry, but it's worth repeating. I told them, you have to look at all these people who are going to come, because every drug dealer in Berkeley County, West Virginia, is going to be at this funeral. You have to look at them like they're your grandchildren or your children. You have to love them like they are your own people. And some of them said, I don't know if I can do that. But they fixed a meal, and Mary Catherine Owens, this chubby little lady in her 70s, walked into the parking lot, shaking like a leaf. She said, I'd like you to come and have lunch with us. And some of them laughed at her. But Aaron came in. And he stayed, and he changed his life. He was driving down the road in his car, and he saw a woman carrying a baby, and her heel had broken off her shoe, and he stopped, and he gave her his car. That's how much Christ changed his life. Right then and there, he changed his life. He sold his house because his house had been bought with money that he had earned selling drugs, and he gave that money away because that's a witness to the power of Jesus Christ in his life. And then he came to church on a Sunday morning, scared to walk in. He came in very late because he sort of had trouble with mourning. He had on a hoodie because he had tattoos that represented his old life. 
skull and crossbones, and the crossbones were hypodermic needles. I want people to see that. Didn't want the children to church to see that, so he had a hoodie on. Covered his head and his face. He was the palest white boy I've ever seen. I mean, he was absolutely white with his black hoodie on, and he came in, sort of stooped over and walked all the way to the front and sat right in front of me because he knew I would not reject him. And I saw the looks on people's faces when he walked and they were scared. What's he gonna do? And somebody told me later, don't worry, Reverend, I was ready. I said, what do you mean you're ready? He said, I had my gun. I was ready to take him out if I had to in the church. All he wanted to do was get to Jesus Christ. He became the custodian of the church, and months later his mother came and stood up during the joys and concerns and in tears said, I want to thank you for saving my son's life. I want to thank this congregation for saving my son's life. That's a witness. It's a powerful witness. If you see something, you got to say something. If you see Jesus Christ in the world around you, I see Jesus Christ here all the time. I see Jesus in the mission team here. I see Jesus in the ladies who sit and knit and crochet hats for babies they don't even know. I see Jesus Christ here in Vacation Bible School. I see it in the faces of our children. I see it in the teachers who give them themselves again and again and again because nobody else will volunteer to do the job. I see it in the ladies who make sure the food gets to the food pantry and all those who work at Thrifty Penny. I see it again and again and again. There was a man who was coming in there, you know, he's buying clothes in all different sizes, and they thought, well, he must have a big family. He told them he buys clothes at the Thrifty Penny to distribute to homeless people in Baltimore City. You know what they did then? They stopped charging him for anything he bought. That's witnessing to Jesus Christ and the power of his presence in the world. That's what's going to change the world. We can arm ourselves and buy more guns and more guns and more guns. It's not going to make us any safer. I'm telling you that right now. Has it made us any safer? I don't think it has. Oh, I'm going to suffer for this sermon, I'm sure. But God has called me to speak what I feel from Christ in my heart. Sometimes I say, oh, Lord, please don't make me say that. And God says, I want you to speak for me. Can I get a witness? A witness in a courtroom setting is someone who is called, sometimes subpoenaed, sometimes comes willingly to offer testimony. It's amazing, isn't it, that courtrooms, lawyers even say, sometimes the best witness is not necessarily an eyewitness. Because if you're an eyewitness and you're pumping a lot of adrenaline and something's going on, you don't necessarily get it right or get all the facts. You see what you see because of your outlook and everything else. Now. The men who were there on that hillside with Jesus, they were eyewitnesses. But that was 2,000 years ago. The people they told in a compelling way believed them. And we are here today because someone loved them enough to share the story with them and someone loved you enough to share the story with you. Who do you love enough to tell about your Savior? Who do you know that needs to know what you know about Jesus Christ? Who do you know who needs to be forgiven? Who do you know who thinks there is no hope in the world? Mental illness is a problem in this country. Who do you know that may be in danger to him or herself or someone else? If you see something, say something. That's become a sort of a law enforcement phrase, hasn't it? If you're suspicious of your neighbor, turn him in. That's not what we're talking about here. We're saying if you see Jesus Christ in the world around you, say something and be prepared to suffer for what you say. Every single one of those disciples who had been hiding when he was raised from the dead, who stood staring into the sky when he left. I always think of the Wizard of Oz. Every time I read this story, I think of the Wizard of Oz when he's up there in the balloon floating away and they're going, what do we do now? You know that's what they were thinking, right? Come back, please come back, Lord. But 10 days later, the Holy Spirit was breathed into their lives and every last one of them gave their life for him. You're not being asked to give your life. You may, you may. Now, the man who brought his gun to church said, you wouldn't feel that way if he had tried something and I protected you, would you? Let me tell you right now, if somebody's going to kill me in the church and it's between them killing me and you taking a human life in this, the house of God, let them kill me because I know where I'm going. 
Don't shoot anybody on my behalf. I'm telling you that right now. Do not kill anybody on my behalf because you'd have to live with that the rest of your life, and I don't want you to have to do that. We've got to start living in a different way, folks. We've got to start living in the love that Christ compels us and commands us to do. We just preached it a couple weeks ago. Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another. The only way you'll know my disciples is by your love for one another. I don't know what happened to the young man who decided that he was going to go out in a blaze of glory taking the lives of all those little babies in that school and two teachers, one whose husband went home and had a heart attack and died, leaving four more children without parents. I don't know where he is. I don't know where he'll be in eternity, but I know that God will be with those who let God be with those who have been hurt. So I want you to embrace somebody this week, whether it's a school child or whatever. You don't have to have prayer in school. You can pray for schools. Pray for them every day. Will you commit yourselves to praying for the safety of the children in the schools around here? Can I get a witness? Will you really pray for them every day? Pray for their safety. Picture them going in and out. Pray for them every day. Will you do that? Can I get a witness? Will you tell somebody, especially somebody in need, what God has done for you in Jesus Christ? Will you tell them where you've screwed up, where you've made a mess of things, and God came to you anyway and raised you up? Can I get a witness? Will you tell somebody about the love of God? That is what's going to save the world. We can arm ourselves to the teeth, and it's not going to change a thing. But if we could learn to love in a real way, the world is going to change. The world will change. Tell someone about Jesus Christ so that 2,000 more years, if he hasn't come back yet, somebody will be sitting here saying that the people of Epworth Church back then loved me enough to share the story of God's redeeming love. That is what is going to change the world. Change the world in Christ's name. Amen.